anything that we think is normal, they did not have. Yeah. And I just want to just highlight it really hard and squarely that so many people in the US, maybe not the people listening because they've kind of figured this stuff out by now, mm -hmm. that we just think it's normal. You think it's normal to have allergies and to have digestive issues and have yeah. the cramping and this. Everything we've listed is not normal. This is not how humans yeah. should live. This is what we saw across all the different tribes, all the different clans. They do not live like this. You do not have to live with these things as a human. This is not our natural state. And we think it's normal. And we try to get all these little patches and medications to try to ameliorate these symptoms, but they're not normal in the first place. Yes, it's not normal at all. And that was interesting, Brian, because they really didn't have much of a need for medicine. When we would ask them about questions like, do you use this plant or this plant that's used widely in the rest of the world and growing right around them, they have no need because they don't have the conditions that it treats. And so it was really interesting. You can kind of see why our uh, healthcare system has developed out of a need because we've gotten so far away from our natural state of perfect health, that we need all these things seemingly to prop us up. But really, we, we don't need those things. We need to get back to uh, how we were living. Hello friends, we're back for another African adventure. I implore you to watch the YouTube version of this interview on the Food Lies YouTube channel. I spent a very long time adding in all the photos and videos that we referenced throughout this episode, even more than the last episode, four times as many as the last episode. It'd be a shame to not see all the visuals. You can even watch it on 2x speed if you click on the settings icon on the video on YouTube. Some of it is a bit graphic, I'll warn you. I even put in a recording of the song the Hadza sing to us, the full recording close out the episode as well. We got to spend time with two different Hadza groups, which was very keen understanding more about their health and habits. Seeing eight tribes or communities in total across Tanzania and Uganda was also paramount to our observations. Getting as many data points as we could really helped give us a well-rounded look at these cultures. Even this was just scratching the surface, however. We just got this one window into their lives and it would be ideal to come back at different times of the year and see even more groups. I don't want to spoil any of the stories, but I'll say we had some epic adventures going on long hunts with them and eating very nose to tail. Speaking of nose to tail, that's what my company is called. We have premium meat, snacks, and body care products from sustainable ranches at nosetail.org. My other company is called Sapien, where I work with Dr. Gary Schliffer to help people lose weight, reverse disease, and improve metabolic health. You can find more at sapien.org. This is how this podcast and most of my work is possible. I have these two businesses that offer products and services I 100% believe in and have developed from scratch or with people who are the best at what they do. I turn down all other advertising and partnership offers. Even though I leave a lot of money on the table, I think this is the best way to be unbiased with my content. By supporting Notes to Tail and Sapien, you're getting a great win-win. You get top quality products and I can continue to pay for all the content production. We have something for everyone from grass-fed and finished meat delivered to your door to the air-dried beef snacks to the freshly ground seasonings to the body care products. These are all at nosetail.org and there's free shipping options for all products if you put together a box. Plus, we have the Sapien program that I mentioned earlier and the Sapien tribe if you want to get more involved in the community. You get all the bonus content, Zoom calls, and perks, including a perpetual nose to tail large discount. Find it all at sapien.org. You can still support the film on Indiegogo. You can click through from sapien.org. And you can also support the show at no cost by sharing with family and friends and giving a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. It all really helps. Thanks so much, and please enjoy this next adventure with Mary Ruddick and I. We're back with Mary Ruddick for their second episode in our Africa series. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm so excited to spend some time with you today. <laughs> Let's do it. Another, another session of this awesome download of information. We learned so much. Um, I want to encourage people to watch this on YouTube. We're going to be putting photos and maybe a little video later. Uh, I'll, I'll patch them in. And also I have my Maasai beads here and I have my Maasai, uh, what is it? The neck, the necklace for yes. the ladies in the background on my wall. 
And uh, it's always wonderful to see Mary's face. <laughs> so watch it on YouTube on the Food Lies channel. And today we're going to be talking about the Hadza. So if you're just coming in, the Messiah, or last time we deep dived into everything we learned from them. And today we're going to talk about our experience visiting two different Hadza clans. And we spent three days with the first one. And we just kind of spent a, a little bit of time with the second one. But it was very interesting to see the difference. And uh, yeah, let's let's jump in. Do you have any high-level thoughts about them in general to start us off? Well, I'll tell you, I was very excited to come and see them. There are several hunter-gatherer clans that are still around, not just the Hudsa, but, uh, but I think realistically, these are all the last generations, most likely, that we're going to see living their traditional lifestyle. And many of them have already been impacted. So I came in uh, with an interest to see what their health was really like. I've often spoken to patients, you know, I, I teach multiple different diets. And one of the ways that I always explain that to patients was that you've got the Hudsa in one part of Tanzania and the Maasai in another part of Tanzania they're not that far from each other. They eat radically different diets, and yet they're both equally healthy. That was always what I had gotten from my research. And what was interesting in, in going to see them and surprising was that I, I did not find them as healthy as the Maasai, at least not now, uh, not the first clan that we visited with. And so it was it was very surprising uh, for me <laughs> personally. So that, that was my big takeaway. What was yours? <laughs> Mine mm -hmm. definitely was, I had this picture, you know, you read, I've read Stefan Guillenet's book about the hungry brain that mentioned the Hadza a lot. Mm -hmm. I've read all kinds of different studies or just heard different accounts. And they're like, they eat 60 different kinds of plants mm -hmm. and they're this and this. That is not what they do. Again, we just saw two groups. We're not saying we're experts mm -hmm. in every single Hadza ever, but they ate, we saw one type of tuber, or maybe there's two, there's a tubers, they ate, well, the day we were there, or we were there for four days total, they had one type of leaf. <laughs> it was like the pumpkin leaf. <laughs> and then the rest was meat. And they had honey. So they had one vegetable, one tuber, all kinds of meat, and some honey. But, of course, this was, you know, just a small snapshot. But, that you know what I mean? They, they're like, they eat tons of fiber. They eat the rainbow. They're eating a million plants. That was shocking. No. They do not eat the rainbow. And, in fact, there were many plants that, that we passed during the hunting days and all of those kind of things. And, honestly, just around their camp where – people in other parts of the world eat those plants and they don't. I kept asking them about certain medicinal plants I could identify and certain edible plants and they just don't. I was also shocked by the complete lack of uh, consumption of plants and, and fiber in general. I had, I had expected them to eat a lot because that's what's always written about them. And it was interesting when we interviewed them, you know, Brian and I were very lucky because our guide grew up with them. So he actually spoke their language, uh, the Hadza language, which is very rare. And so we could ask complex, complex questions and get complex answers. And, uh, and it was surprising because with both of the, the Hudson groups that we visited, they had some different answers in terms of plant matter. Like the first group uh, only eats plant matter about uh, uh, five to seven months a year depending. And so it's not year round. Berries are eaten for four months a year. At least that's what they report. And I, I can see that when we're walking around, there's not a lot of, <laughs> a lot of things to eat, uh, at least for, from my four and I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were after meat. That's what they ate. They, they go after meat, and they didn't have a hard time getting it. No. I mean, even the first day they kind of showed us around, we, we did like a, a hunt in mm -hmm. quotes, but we actually didn't go on a full hunt. I guess maybe they're testing us. I think they but were to they, see if we could hold up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we did like four hours with them and it was fine, but it wasn't like, oh man, you know, these bozos from the U S are, are, are going to not have a, let us get our dinner tonight mm -hmm. because they still had dinner and they had a dick dick and we ate that with them and we could talk about that, but they, there seemed to be sort of, they had food around. But then the bigger story is this is not how they used to live. They used to be amongst tons and tons of animals and have, you know, a whole different array of, of animals to eat. But even in these kind of constricted environment, yeah. they still could get meat. Yeah. Yeah. 
It, I was surprised by how much meat they got. And maybe that's not usual, but they got a good amount. And I will say that first hunting trip that we took, that was like four or five hours. I think they were fully vetting us because they walked us straight through thorns. And these weren't just like thorns on the side. There were thorns coming from above us to both sides. And then these plants that were kind of like the, what is that? The yucca plants that stab straight up. And so if you bend over, you can poke out your eye. Like <laughs> it was, like, And they did not have to take Take us through that because the second day no. we didn't go through any of that we did and you can go, go right around that so i think they were yeah. definitely like testing our fortitude for sure before taking us on the the long all-day hunt <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah so we'll, we'll set the stage a little more so uh if people have been paying attention uh, dr paul saldino was supposed to come with us and he ended up doing his own trip earlier and was going to continue on but didn't end up making it. And it was with Anthony Gustin, another friend of mine. And so it was sad that we didn't get to really do the trip with them. We overlapped for a day. Um, but it was really cool that we got to hang out with the same group yeah. that they went to. So if anyone's wondering, yes, we are talking, the main group that we went hunting with is the same group that Paul Saladino went with. And we did see the same dog, the dog that got uh, just a huge chunk taken out of his back from a baboon. And we got to see it. A week later and it was healing and it was running around and it was fine it was pretty amazing there was flies all over it but they put some green you know plant medicine on it and it was healing up and it went on the big you know eight to ten hour hunt that we did the second day well they went 10 hours i think we did the eight hour we version eight. we went home <laughs> a little early but uh yeah it was amazing that the dog was uh still doing fine it was it was really impressive i was very impressed with all of those dogs <laughs> they weren't uh, the hardiest dogs. I mean, they were a bit skin and bones, but that's because they needed all the meat for themselves. They were. And so the dogs would only get like kind of the, they'd get the guts and they'd get some of the bones. Mm -hmm. But even the, the Hudza, like this old man, he was getting into the tiniest little bones and sucking every bit of bone marrow out of it before he gave it to the dogs. So Yeah, I, I don't know what the dogs got. The dogs were very thin, but the dogs were very happy. So I know a lot of people commented on the picture saying that uh, they were worried about the dogs, but the dogs honestly were very happy. They, they weren't as healthy looking as some of the other communities, even the other Hudsa community that we visited with or clan. Uh, their, their dogs were very healthy looking, but, um, but these dogs were very happy despite being skinny. Yeah. Well, I think they had a lot of them too. I mean, yeah. there wasn't just enough food to go around, but they, they were doing fine. <laughs> yes. All right. So we'll set the stage a little bit more. So this group was very cool, very interesting. They had a very nice setup there on this amazing giant rock and this cave and this fire. But the only downside is it was more of a touristy group, mm -hmm. right? And this is really going to play into our discussion because this is the group that gets the tourists that get the treats and the snacks and the tobacco and the, all this stuff brought in by the tourist groups. And so the tourist groups would kind of blow in for an hour and then leave, right? It was like, you, you see some guy that just blows in there. They, they take their photos and they leave. And what Paul's group and our group did was a different experience. You know, we spent three days, we, we kept coming back and doing actual hunts with them and actually experiencing more of what their life was. So uh, yeah, it was interesting to see their health though. So maybe you could comment about this particular group's health. It was, I was honestly shocked. I would say of all the, all the communities I visited, I found it to be the least robust. Now I, I say that with a bit of a grain of salt because they're far more healthy than Americans and even Europeans mm -hmm. at far more. I mean, they just don't have the chronic disease and these kind of things, but, but they were not as healthy as the other communities that we visited. So, so that was really the biggest takeaway for me. And, and you could really see that in the women in particular, you know, and uh, as I say this, you, you should realize these men are going on very long hikes. I mean, like the one that we did was 22 kilometers with them. And this is through a lot of elevation. So that's not on flat land. It's, it's through tough, uh, mm -hmm. tough forest, but 
but uh, you could see you could see some of the health issues creeping in and not being as healthy uh, and that sort of thing. So yeah, that that was shocking. I really expected them to be in perfect health. There also weren't a lot of elders, so there was uh, a couple of men, maybe fifties, sixties, that kind of thing. But I didn't see as many elders in this community as in the others. Well, this is a small community. It's totally too. small. So we, so we can't say it was, it was may very not small. speak for it at all. Yes, <laughs> not at all. And, and yeah, and they mm -hmm. didn't have like overt health issues. Their mm -hmm. their teeth were kind of messed up. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't you know as robust as every other tribe we visit had yeah. very great, amazing wide jaws, teeth, all that stuff. Yes. So, but I, I just attribute that to tons of smoking of tobacco, smoking weed and eating sweets. Yeah. I mean, even we, brought, you brought them, you know, some honey, it was like a honey bar with, it was just two ingredients, honey and sesame seeds yeah. from Greece, I think. Uh -huh. And they just chomped it down, you know? It's like, this is, you could tell this is what they get. It's like, oh, we're gonna, you know, all these tourists like, oh, try this candy, try this cake. And yeah, and they do, and that, right? Why, why wouldn't they? That is something that I didn't put together until after and when we kind of like had our powwow about it because I was wondering the whole time, like, why are, why don't they have the same level of health? You know, they barely get maize. They have maize during the dry, dry season. Uh, and, and that's basically a supplement because they've been pushed out of their land. So they can't get access to all the animals that they had before. So it's not like they've had multiple generations on the maize. And it's not even like they're eating that much maize uh, to create kind of some of the, the things that I was seeing. And to give you some insight, what I was seeing was that the children had very snotty noses. You don't usually see that. You don't tend to see allergies. Uh, they had a lot of coughing of all ages, kind of like a rattly cough. And the women were, uh, most of them were overweight. They weren't social. Uh, most of the places that I go, the women are very welcoming, very social. And these women seemed subdued. Uh, uh, they didn't have a lot of energy, uh, outward energy, and their feet had signs of inflammation and some other issues. So these, again, are very, very minor in comparison to what we deal with. There's still, uh, at mm -hmm. least in these groups, um, no autism, no uh, autoimmunity, no chronic disease, you know, these kind of things. But, and this is in an area where they don't have clean water, where there is malaria and all sorts of infections. And, uh, and they're sleeping outside with black mambas and serious spiders and all sorts of things. So really, given that environment, they're in incredible health, but they were not in the same level of health as many of the other communities. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it was good to, I'm so glad we got to see so many different communities yeah. in two countries, we went to Uganda as well. So mm -hmm. we really got a good picture of some really healthy people. I don't want to uh, yeah. spoil it too much, but we saw a woman who's 120 years old, who had six generations of her family, five below her, and she was dancing and in such great health. So we, we saw a lot of very healthy people. So it sounds like we're putting down this yes. Hadza group, but they're actually very strong, very healthy. These guys uh they okay we tried to pull their bow back we could barely <laughs> pull their bow back it was hard and these guys were not big strong guys they're very wiry and very fit but not the big strong guys you know we see in the us or you know in these developed countries yes and they could pull back that bow and hold it yeah and they could run all day you know walk run the whole day so <laughs> yes so they, yeah, so they were very fit, very healthy, but it just didn't seem like they lived a super long time too. And this is another thing we were trying to figure out. Uh, the, it seemed like people would die in their 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and in this group. Yeah, and it did seem right? like when we would ask them what people would die of, it did seem either old age or infection, but that it was very common when you were old that you would catch an infection. So it seems like the person's immunity could hold them off when they were younger if they got something. And it sounded like the infections that they would get wouldn't be too big of a deal uh, until they were old. So, you know, they would drink some herbs and three days later they'd be okay and it wasn't common for them to get sick. So their immune system seemed to work very well. But I could see where you know, and I'm speculating here, but I could see where if you're uh, getting up into maybe the 60s, the 70s, and you catch a bronchial infection, a lung infection, uh, you just don't have the wherewithal. And that that may very well be a part of, uh, of the modern issue, since they don't have their traditional land anymore. They don't have, I mean, from what I could see, 
uh, they weren't getting a lot of fat in their diet. They were eating the whole animal nose to tail mm -hmm. and brain of course has a lot of fat in it and skin as well. And these kind of things, but in comparison to eating big game, like they used to do their, their fat was much lower. I, you know, I'm sure it's been analyzed, but if I had to guess on what we saw just from that, that week, I would guess, or those few days, I would guess maybe 20% of their diet was coming from fat, which isn't low fat, but it's, it's lower than most traditional cultures. Well, yeah, you want those fat soluble yes. vitamins and yeah, it seemed like they were kind of in this protein sparing modified fast yes. a little bit. Maybe that's why their bodies, they kind of have teenage boy bodies. They do. Right? It's what well, it's like very it's just a lot of protein and then not much fat and not much carbs. It yeah. was just kind of like we have a protein diet yeah. and maybe that's what you look like if you have a protein diet. It was shocking how low carb their diet was. And, uh, and yeah, it did seem low fat. And that's, that's relevant to me because I know if someone comes into my practice with a lung issue, I know we need to work on saturated fat. Saturated fat is really good for regenerating lung tissue. And, uh, and with the animals that they were eating, the dick dick, the baboon, the bush babies, these are all relatively lean animals uh, in comparison to what they used to eat. And so they may not be getting enough of the saturated fat to be rebuilding and strengthening their immune system against the kind of very serious infections that they're living with. Well, and to bring back the smoking, they were smoking a lot. And, you know, tourists would bring them tobacco, they'd trade for it, they'd get weed, bush weed out there that was really alarming is they were using for the rolling papers, mm. a lot of time they're using receipts, yeah. and like magazines, like with full ink and like all the weird plastics and all the weird chemicals and all that stuff and they were smoking it yes no so, yeah and that's and they did mention people would die of lung problems that was brought up the most recently Yes, that was yes. brought up the most. They were, um, every time we asked them about people our age, if our age had died, they would say no. But the, um, yeah, lung issues seemed very prevalent and every member seemed to talk about those quite a bit. And you're right. I mean, if you all haven't looked into what those chemicals can do, they're, they're pretty nasty. So the fact that they're inhaling those on a regular basis, I think, is actually largely problematic. Yeah. And then we should jump to the comparison to the second group we visited just to compare their health. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about that. I'd love to. Okay. So the second clan that we visited was a, a bit of a drive away, not too long, but enough to where the, the plants growing were a bit different. And they too uh, were eating meat when we were there. They had quite a bit at the fire and they were what I had initially expected. They were in great health, <laughs> like really great health. The mm -hmm. women were radiant. They were healthy, beautiful smiles, great energy. The children were healthy. They didn't have the snotty noses. The men looked like models. I mean, they were just like chiseled jaw and great shape. Um, well, to me, I mean, looks are, you know, specific to each person. And I don't mean models like beautiful. I mean, like uh, they, they seemed like good specimens of, of humans, right? Like very healthy looking. So not to say that they're, they're perfect by any means, but it was more of what I had expected to see. And, and this group did eat a little bit differently. So they have a lot of cassava growing there, which is a root vegetable that's prevalent throughout the belt of Africa. So the, the, Eastern Belt where we were, and then also all the way over to Nigeria. And uh, they would uh, peel it and chew on it and remove the fiber and then uh, eat some of the middle part, which contributed to their water intake as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, totally different picture there. They also had really beautiful teeth really beautiful teeth there and amazing. i amazing yeah i realize there must be many listeners who are like who cares what it, how is this relevant but actually your your teeth really show your nutrient profile of the body if you have deficiencies if your uh, nervous system is imbalanced if you have a nervous system condition even say anxiety or insomnia it throws off your your mineral balance and you can get the gum disease and the tooth decay and these kind of things so it's easy we get so used to seeing people with beautiful teeth in in, in uh, Europe and in America, but that's because of all the dental work that's been done. It's very rare to see so many people with such gorgeous teeth. And we saw that with both the Maasai that we discussed before and with this group of, of the Hudson. With no dentists at all. No. I mean, these are people actually living in the bush in huts. They would have no idea what we're talking about if we started asking about a dentist. <laughs> yes. And yeah, these women eating these cassava roots, amazing teeth. They look like Mary's. Mary has the best teeth I've ever seen. <laughs> By the way, you got to watch the video version. 
But uh, just great teeth. And yes, they, they peel off the outside, get rid of the fibers outside. Then they chew on it and then they spit out the fiber. Yes. Right. So they weren't, they're not eating high fiber diets. And, you know, people are talking, oh, the microbiome, they're eating like a hundred types of plants. So I mean, the microbiome is so amazing. Like, how about they're eating, you know, a couple of times of plants, not much fiber, and they're just, getting the dirt yes. they're getting they're they're not washing their hands that everything was dirty mm -hmm. i mean everything had dirt on it every this whole trip we were just eating dirt we we're eating intestinal <laughs> everything so we had the i think that's where you get the microbiome from i think so too and this group was different in a few different ways so um they there was a tree growing all around their little camp that they would chew on. So they'd remove the bark and chew and use it as a toothpick. And it's an antiseptic plant. And then also they had more access to cassava. So whereas the first Hudson group would, during the dry season, uh, use maize to, to supplement their diet, this group didn't. They used uh, cassava. They had cassava year round, whereas the first group really only had it about five to seven months of the year, depending on where they were. And so they had slightly different diets. They had that. And the rolling papers that we at least saw them use in, in this instance were dried leaves, which are dried leaves from the, the coroner sorghum stalk, which is completely different from the receipts. This group also didn't get the taurus. Uh, they don't tend to see taurus at all in this group. And so they, they hadn't been exposed to candy and sugar and that kind of thing. Yeah, a lot of big differences, and mm -hmm. it was remarkable. I mean, yeah. they were just a different health status, and yeah. Um, what else? What else about this group? Anything? Because I want to jump back to the original group. But did okay. oh, you asked some questions about the same type of questions. How you know? Do you have yes, the women and children? Oh, also, mm -hmm. we only saw the women and children eating the cassava. That's true. We didn't see uh, maybe the, the men, men ate it. The men were cooking the yeah. meat at the time yeah. and the the children will kind of float from the females to the males but the males and females tend to stay pretty separate during the day not to be like sterile or anything it's just that their activities are a bit separate there's strong gender roles as you see in most of these communities so uh so yeah the, but they were very relaxed and very happy and they had phenomenal answers to our questions you know it was really amazing and in both of these groups uh speaking to the women they had the women had never experienced period cramps. They had never experienced infertility. Uh, birth was in two hours and a quick recovery. Uh, no need for for uh, healing a long period of time. Uh, no one had ever had an issue with nursing. You know that's that's often an issue in the states. Women can't produce milk or the baby can't latch or they're tongue tied. None of these things uh, had ever occurred. They couldn't imagine a woman not being able to nurse. So no need for herbs to produce milk supply or anything. They, they honestly didn't have much of a need for medicine in this second group, but neither of the groups, despite the, the women's perceived uh, uh, lesser health in the first group, they still didn't have issues with fertility like we do in the States. No PCOS, no endometriosis, none of that kind of stuff. No, no depression, no problems with sleeping. No. Mary asked all the questions. They, <laughs> like anything that we think is normal, they did not have. Yeah. And I just want to just highlight it really hard and squarely that so many people in the U.S., maybe not the people listening because they've kind of figured this stuff out by now, mm -hmm. that we just think it's normal. You think it's normal to have allergies and to have digestive issues and have yeah. the cramping and this. Everything we've listed is not normal. This is not how humans yeah. should live. This is what we saw across all the different tribes, all the different clans. They do not live like this. You do not have to live with these things as a human. This is not our natural state. And we think it's normal. And we try to get all these little patches and medications to try to ameliorate these symptoms, but they're not normal in the first place. Yes, it's not normal at all. And that was interesting, Brian, because they really didn't have much of a need for medicine. When we would ask them about questions like, do you use this plant or this plant that's used widely in the rest of the world and growing right around them, they have no need because they don't have the conditions that it treats. And so it was really interesting. You can kind of see why our uh, healthcare system has developed out of a need because we've gotten so far away from our natural state of perfect health, that we need all these things seemingly to prop us up. But really, we, we don't need those things. We need to get back to uh, how we were living. So yeah, it was fascinating. They don't even have, you know, we even asked about dementia. I got 
the chief really embarrassed. I asked him lots of questions about his stool and <laughs> what was mm -hmm. normal. <laughs> and the ladies were very shy about answering some of the questions about fertility and, and sex and all of those kinds of things. But, um, but, you know, they did, they answered, which was so lovely because we got to, we got to field those questions to so many different people. We got it on film and, uh, and the answers are just uh, mind boggling in that they just, they don't exist. So what we have come to think of as very normal as anything but. Yeah, I'm glad we hit that. I just want to show this. If you're watching the video, oh. I got one of the Hadza arrows. <laughs> it made it back. Somehow I carried this around I'm so glad. to many different countries, uh, many different airports. Very cool. I'm so and, glad uh, that got let's... through. <laughs> yeah, we can use that to jump back to the first group. So we, we this is the group we spent three days with. We did the hunting. This was the one with a little bit less robust health. Uh, what else did you find? So they didn't drink a lot of water. I, they, yeah. So they didn't have the water, but they also didn't have the salt. And I think that's connected. But maybe we can talk I think about it that. probably is too. You know, to paint the picture, this is equatorial. Tanzania. It was hot. It was sunny. We were sweating, and <laughs> hiking mm -hmm. all day long. And uh, all of us Americans, we were needing a lot of water. And these guys, I think a, a good takeaway for everyone, us included, is that when these guys go on these uh, long hunts, and they do this on a daily basis. It could be a five hour hunt. It could be a 15 hour hunt. It just depends when they catch the animal, right? What's so important to take home from this is that they don't bring any water with them. They don't bring any snacks with them or meals with them. They don't pack a lunch. They pack nothing. Mm -hmm. And not because they don't have it. They, they have an abundance of food, at least from what I can see. I'm sure that varies, but, but it's because they don't need it. They're not actually thirsty and they're not hungry. I was blown away by how little water they drank and how much, how little they needed. Mm -hmm. When we would come upon water, you know, they collect it in the baobab yeah. trees and they also like there's a little stream that they dig for that's under the the dried up riverbed mm -hmm. uh but they didn't they didn't uh go after it as if someone was very thirsty it wasn't like us chugging our water bottles as we're going mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they just had like a little bit and then they went on and i i think you're right i think the lack of salt allowed for that although i don't fully understand it uh uh yeah I think I think they they don't require much water very clearly, and they also don't require much food. So when you're going on a four hour drive and you're packing a whole bunch of snacks for those kids, you might want to rethink that. We don't actually need a lot of food with us at all times, especially when we're well balanced and well fed. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, they must have, must have just adapted to the the water not needing it. Yeah. And yeah, that water was dirty too. They got the the it was brown it was out of the brown. baobab tree. It was pure brown. Yeah, it was brown. Yeah. All of their water is brown. And remember too, I mean, we hiked at least, what, at least five miles before we hit water or maybe two and a half. It was a good amount of water or time before we hit the water. So mm -hmm. they're not washing their dishes. They're not washing their knives. So like when they were feeding us the, the brain of the dick dick and cutting things open, that is a knife that probably has never been washed before, right? So there's a lot of bacterial <laughs> exchange on this and, and this whole environment. So you've got the dirty water uh, that has a lot of microbes in it that our, our microbiomes really couldn't handle. You know, anyone raised in, the, in America would not be uh, adept to drinking that kind of water and yet they don't get sick. It, it was very impressive. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think it's a good thing up until a point. Yeah. So we're trying to theorize why they would they would die earlier than mm -hmm. some of the other groups we visited. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think some of these things, it's good. You, you have a good, strong microbiome, and they can handle all these things. And we talked about the lungs and the smoking. But, you know, the, not washing things can lead to problems. You know, at a certain point, it's good until it's not. You know, it's good until you drink the wrong water, and then all of a sudden you're dead because it's an actual pathogen you can't you know, fight off. And I think had they still had their land with the large animals, uh, this may not be an issue, but I think now that they have the uh, influx of tourist treats, because tourists are encouraged to bring some kind of gift or snack. So many people will bring candy. And then you have the, the very toxic uh, paper that they're smoking with. And 
Uh, and then, of course, you have their environment, which is a very difficult environment for humans to survive in. I think all of those things impact their immune function. So maybe if they were uh, living in their old way, they could get away with it, but maybe not now. We'll never know that answer. But I do think if they had access to clean water and, uh, and more fat, I think they would live longer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to bring up this study because it you know, it's one study, but it's longevity among hunter gatherers across cultural examination and link to it in the show notes. But they have the, the, these authors have the Hadza at a modal age of death at 76. Mm -hmm. So that's the most often uh, age that people died at 76. Obviously, if you take the average or mean, that could be down to 40 or 35. And that's what plant-based advocates in the mainstream like to talk about, but that's not that doesn't mean anything because yeah. of infant mortality and all these other problems, yeah. accidents and this and that. So uh, this study, it has the different, uh, th there's eight groups and they live between 68 and 78 and most on the higher side, 74, 75, 78, Simone. Like these people do live a pretty long time, even though they have these rough lives. And then just from our trip, we, we met people who are, you know, over a hundred. And so if, if you have a little bit better situation where, you know, like the Maasai, they have their cows and they have more consistent, great animal based nutrition, you know, there's, you know, Clemens, the Maasai elder said his dad lived to 110. We spent time with the, the Batwa and, you know, this woman was said to be 120. So yes. Yeah. I saw a big difference in the communities that had cattle and herded. Uh, those that had the dairy and the meat on hand at all times and didn't have to hunt for it, didn't have to work for it, definitely saw much, much uh, older folks. And Joseph, our, our wonderful guide who grew up in that region, he's of the Iraq tribe, uh, he spoke about how they were known, the Hudson were known in that region for not living as long as the other communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, we I just want to shout out yeah. to Joseph. He's like the Iraq. <laughs> You know, it's tried. hard to pronounce. But, uh, yeah, it is. It just—it was so great having. The, he fluently spoke the language of the Hadza, and so we got a really very detailed perspective of what they were actually saying. Yeah, so I that mean, was amazing. And these, yeah. He, and one more thing, sorry, they weren't exploited. This was not some exploitative thing where we came with these, you know, run-of-the-mill guys that just blow in there and blow out. Like this guy knew them for you know he grew up with them and we got the the real experience and we uh, yeah i i just wanted to throw that out <laughs> yeah we got very lucky yeah he he spoke the language so well that they were joking you know they had slang and they were joking and he spent his off time with them he spent holidays with them like they were actually friends and that's that's how fluent he was so it was it, it was very lucky and yeah i can't recommend him more highly <laughs> Uh -huh. All right. So let's go through this hunt. Mm -hmm. So it was really cool where the first day we got there and within 20 minutes, a guy showed up with a dick dick. <laughs> yes. Right. So that was awesome. So that we had that experience with, I was worried that we go on this long hunt and not get an animal and, or not be there to prepare and eat it. Me too. But it just so happened that they got that that morning and the guy showed up with it. And that was really cool because they just, he, he had it slinged over his shoulder. They threw it down on a rock. They opened it up just so quick. They're like, doo -doo, slice, slice, slice. Again, they, you know, sliced open. There was guts everywhere. There was yellows and greens all over this guy's knife. Cut off a liver, gave it to me, ate it raw. It was, it was great. It tasted a little, a little bit like some uh, stool, but. <laughs> That was just because the outside, <laughs> but I was again, worried again. Not the clean knife. We, yes. <laughs> not the clean knife. And what I said, we said in the first episode, we were a hundred percent stomachs digestive the entire trip. hundred percent felt amazing, even eating all these weird things. And it was also cool that they uh, acknowledged that none of the other people visiting wanted to eat the raw liver. I'm yes. sure Paul and Anthony did. I know that, mm -hmm. but 
uh, aside from them, they're like, whoa, these guys are eating the raw liver. All right. <laughs> I think it gave us some street cred from the beginning. Yeah, because they gave us the raw liver, the raw kidney, a bit of lung, and then they started cooking it. And the young boy, he looked to me about eight or so, started working on cooking the head. And it was really fascinating because he cut a slit in it after a certain point to like let it kind of poach and steam. Uh, and, and it was also interesting with... Uh, of course, you know, they, they all ate the organ meat first, but they shared it. So, so they cut it into little bites. And again, no one's getting a plate or an individual serving. It's very communal eating. So you cut off a piece and you give it to this person and then you cut off a piece and you give it to this person and then you circle back kind of thing, which is, is just so different than the way we eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really cool. And he, this guy, I think maybe he was 10. I think he was just a little smaller mm -hmm. than normal, but he was of the age of where he went out on the hunts with the mm -hmm. men. And, you know, he was very good. He's the guy who we were messing around with the arrows and he's the one who hit the water bottle yeah. off the, the tree stump, like a far away. Yeah. And he was just, he was going at it. This mm -hmm. guy's going to be the new, the new chief. He's totally but the new chief. He, <laughs> <laughs> so he uh, opened up the head and he, and the brain and he started eating the brain and the brain was good i thought i'd be a little bit squeamish about it but it it was great it was part of the experience i just dug in tasted you know like nothing really it was just a soft pudding type of it was like pudding flavor. What it did was, you think? yeah i thought the yeah. same i thought it was like custard and right before that part so one thing brian and i were both doing was interviewing everyone as we were going and asking what their favorite foods were and right before that lots of people had said brain and we we're like huh interesting okay and mm -hmm. then we got to have it and I, I think we've you've had brain before right have you I've not, no, okay, I, no. I had, but it had been a really long time. I had it when I was healing. So it had been a good 10 years or so, eight years, I'm not sure. Anyway, it was delicious the way they made it. It was more like a dessert. So it was very custard-like and mild, and you could see why so many of the kids and the adults liked it. It was cool. Yeah, yeah it was just passed around. Everyone dipped their finger in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then they, they just smoked and kind of roasted the rest of it and they ate every drop there's the old man sucking on the bones <laughs> opening them up you know getting every bit of bone marrow but that was really cool yeah so that was our first day we, we ate that we got a lot of great filming we uh, sang with them they brought out these little instruments and mary played along <laughs> i'm the <laughs> worst musician stuff. too they were really nice <laughs> <laughs> they went along with it well though you were just like plucking away and they just you know they went with it maybe we can patch in that song uh, i thought it was a great song I did too. and uh, uh, then we went out for our test hunt a little half day test hunt and then uh, the next day is when we we showed up really early and it was really cool how bright when we showed up, there was, you know, there was a greeting where you like, you pound fists and then they just start running. Yes. They're like, we're done. We're out. So we're like, oh, I guess, you know, we got to get the camera gear. And they just took off. They gathered the dogs and we just went. Mm -hmm. and, and they were so that was fast. So cool. They were so fast. Oh, yeah. We had to keep up with them. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we just we just took off. We took a different route. We went, they would stop. If they saw a bird, they'd try to get it. They were so good at finding their arrows too. It was amazing. They just shoot the arrow. And I have no idea where it went. And then it was just automatically, they knew where it was and someone got it and it was easy. Yes. But uh, yeah, we just kept going. We hiked up and down. We went all, you know, throughout this land. We saw such a, a variety of landscapes just going up and it, then we got into the forest more and we hiked up and then that's when they got the bush baby. Yes. So I think you were there for that. I was with that kid up ahead, yeah. just fall, you know, just charging away. I didn't want to get left behind. And then I heard everyone yelling behind us and we loop back around. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you can tell us what happened. Sure. So on the, on the hike leading up to this point, they were going after very small animals. And I remember thinking like, my gosh, they must be like, hungry if they're putting this much effort into getting small birds and things like this not hungry in the immediate like i need to eat right now mm -hmm. i have low blood sugar but hungry in in general like that they're going after small animals uh but when we got up there yeah they had just caught the first bush baby and they handed it to us and i thought it was dead and it was not yet and bush babies mm. for those who don't know they're 
very cute, small animals with a long tail. They look a bit like an elongated chinchilla, and uh, and they're quite adorable. But they're interesting animals in that they're territorial. So unlike other animals that look similar, they, there tends to be one in an area. But they got very lucky here. They got two in a tree, so it was likely that they were mating. That's really the only time the bush babies come together. And so they shot the first one down, and then not not even three minutes later, they got the second one, and they kind of banged it against the rock to further kill it so it had had the arrow wound but that actually didn't kill them the full way enough to stunt them where they weren't moving but they were still breathing so then uh, they banged them against the rock quickly and then they were dead and they tied them onto their clothes to keep going yeah that was really interesting and the guys these old guys were just climbing the trees to get them or get their arrows out and they climb back down and and yeah they just tied it onto their <laughs> little hide and it just was hanging there for the rest of the trip yeah but yeah we should talk that about really that cool. i mean for all that we've said that uh, at least in in this group that there weren't as many older people the uh those that were older like 50 or 60 they were in better shape than we are i mean uh this guy that was on mm -hmm. our hunts i felt uh, was in exceptional health in that he was hiking ahead of everyone and climbing trees and all of that. So uh, their quality of life until they die, I think, is very high. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we kept going, mm -hmm. kept going. They're, they they were just charging. I could tell they were holding back a little bit because we had <laughs> camera gear and this whole thing. So after, I don't know how many hours, I was trying to – I was up front. I'll, I'll just put it you out there because I didn't great. have to I, carry I camera <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any camera equipment. So yeah, I was up there. They finally sat us down. They're like, you know what? You guys can go home if you want. And it was like this sort of polite thing of like, we're going to go, you know, keep going. And, you know, so they did send us back with two people. And it was really lucky because we barely brought any water. I don't know what we were thinking. We didn't bring enough water at all. Yeah. So we had no water for the second half of this trip. Mm -hmm. And it actually became a problem yeah. by the end. Yeah, it really Where, did. Yeah. This is something I kept finding over and over in Tanzania and in, in many parts in that belt, that eastern belt of Africa, is that uh, you just don't know what the day is going to look like, so you're just not prepared. And we knew we had an intensive hike coming up, but we didn't know it was going to be so long, so we didn't want to carry a ton of things, and that was a huge mistake. We should have brought probably two to three times the amount of water for sure. Um, uh, Draco and I brought three of the small waters for ourselves and I drank one and a half because Draco doesn't usually drink much water. He drank mm -hmm. half and then we gave the the third bottle to the, the hunters, the men who were hunting. And it was fascinating when we did that because uh, we all sat down and we handed them the water and they took a knife. And do you remember that? Uh, cut off oh my the God. top? Instead of opening the top, they just sliced off the top. Yes. Yeah, it was fascinating. Was and it wasn't funny. fast for them to do that either. It probably took like a full minute, but you could you could tell they hadn't worked with that before. So and it was a, it was effective. It was great. So uh, so no, we really did. Both our, our guide and, and Draco started to get heat stroke and dehydration by the end of it, because at that point where they were like, hey, listen, we haven't gotten what we need. We're going to keep going. Uh, if you guys want to head back, I think it's a good idea because this could be really long and we've been out for a long time already. Uh, it ended up being a really good thing because from that point, it was still like three hours back to camp, I want to say. So, um, uh, yeah, anyway, on, on the <laughs> on the trip back, you know, time is a bit different in, in, this, in Tanzania than it is in America. And so if you ask someone how long it's going to be, maybe they'll say like, 15 minutes when it could be an hour or half an hour when it's like two hours. <laughs> you just never yeah. know. And was, I think they were trying to keep us hopeful. I think they were so like, too. oh, it's only 15 minutes. And we're like, all right. I think so too. And it, it was, was not. It was very hot and sunny. And I, I'm lucky in that I do well in heat. So I wasn't, I was tired as all of us were from this long hike, but I wasn't on the verge of heat stroke or, or serious dehydration. But yeah, our guide, Moody, whew. <laughs> and Draco were like, <laughs> yeah, yes. it was bad. But luckily, yeah. we got back to the safari vehicle, and we each chugged like three <laughs> bottles of water. Moody sat in the shade for a while and recovered, and yeah, we yes. went on our way. But uh, we should talk about the honey. Mm -hmm. That was so cool because yeah. we, along the way, they just there was this sort of this tree, and it had a little hump on it, like this shape. And one guy recognized it, and then everyone stopped. 
they made a fire uh, from the sticks. You know, they just rubbed the sticks together, got the little um, kindling and a, mm -hmm. a little nest, started up. It was so quick. The one guy brought an axe. I think that was the older guy that took us home. He had his axe. They chopped open that kind of nub and it was hollow in the middle and the bees were there. So they smoked them out, got the big uh, honeycomb out, passed it around. It was it was so cool how they how they did that for us. It was it was really cool and it was eye opening because and maybe it was just that hive, but the honey wasn't sweet at all that I had. The larva mm -hmm. was very good. It was like cereal. It was like how cereal when it's been soaked by milk is what it reminded me of. Um, but yeah, the honey wasn't sweet at all. Was yours? No, it wasn't sweet. Yeah, it's not like well for one thing it could have just been that the comb was a bit empty. True. Right, so mm -hmm. it wasn't saturated, but then yes, it did not taste really sweet, yeah. and um, yeah. Yes, yeah, totally agree. And then also, there were many things that we passed by, like baobab trees. When I, I love baobab, I was introduced to it uh, mm -hmm. a lot in Zimbabwe last year. It's a common snack there, and uh, so we were very excited when we saw the pods and started sucking on those. But the guys, the the Hudson hunters, didn't seem that interested in them. They clearly weren't very oh, hungry. No. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they didn't eat them. We were the only mm -hmm. ones that ate them. I mean, the, the guys just were on the hunt and they did it and mm -hmm. then they came home and then they ate meat. That's all we saw, but yeah. that's just our experience. Maybe they were, you know, eating some berries elsewhere. I don't know what yeah. they were doing, we didn't but see any all berries. I saw them do was eat meat. Yeah, we yeah. didn't see any berries. And that was a question I asked them a lot about, you know, I mentioned earlier, but they said they get berries for three to four months of the year. So this idea that the Hudsa have a very paleo-like diet where they're eating all of this plant year round, uh, at least for this clan was, was not true. Not true at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they went on, they got a big baboon mm -hmm. and we went home. And we had a little campsite. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we came back the next morning and they had this giant baboon, which was pretty gruesome, really. They waited for us to butcher it. Mm -hmm. They were very excited to, the, to wait for us. And then they just did their thing. And I don't know, I was not into it at all. <laughs> Mary and I were kind of talking beforehand, like, are you going to eat it? Are you going to eat it? Or like, oh, we'll see when we get there. <laughs> and once we got there, it was gruesome it was wow. just there's hands i don't want to eat anything with little hands it smelled bad the smell was i don't know yeah the smell was uh uh not like a normal meat it smelled like human honestly mm -hmm. yeah it yeah. wasn't cool so they did their thing mm -hmm. they you know did the same thing they cook it by the fire they did all this stuff we just yeah. sort of observed instead of partaking yeah so yeah <laughs> Um, what else though? What else with the Hadza? Did, mm -hmm. um, we have this list of questions. Mm -hmm. we, we could, we could kind of go over the same questions that we didn't cover already. We but can do that. And I can we, we speak about, about a couple of things too. Um, one thing yeah. Joseph really wanted to stress to us having, having lived with them through the stages of them, you know, getting pushed out of the park and, and now is that they do go hungry at certain points and that unlike the other communities that we visited uh, in, in both countries, they actually have a lot of childhood deaths. So um, uh, maybe not a lot in, in comparison to Americans, but a lot in comparison to what you usually see in these villages, which is really nothing. Uh, so they, they have a lot, but it's not from infection. It's from the cold in the winter. So they live in these little uh, really lovely grass huts. You can see how someone can live in that quite nicely, but they don't have a lot of protection from the elements. And I think, uh, you know, they're they don't wear many clothing, <laughs> items of clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so the children tend to die from the cold if they die in childhood. And that was abnormal. Also in this first group, the same one that Paul and Anthony visited in the dry season, they don't have access to many animals at all. And so they, they do rely more heavily on the maize and they'll trade honey and weed and other things and, and furs for that, for the maize. And so that's becoming a more common food with that group, whereas it was not in the second and would not be if they had access to their land. So, the, so they had quite a few differences as far as that goes. Mm, yeah. Mm. Okay, let's do these questions. Okay. How much is it? How much time do they spend sedentary? I'll go first. They had the they had the most chill life. So their whole life is almost like uh, someone's vacation, 
where it's like they're either chilling by the fire and like eating meat and smoking weed uh, mm -hmm. if that's your type of vacation and laughing and singing or they're just on a hunt and they're just moving 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 10 hours what was your same sort of same and it seems yeah. like they're if they're not hunting it's just full relaxation mode they are sprawling on the ground they're laying down uh life is mm -hmm. easy and fun and they have zero worries about tomorrow they are not that's something i would love for people to take home they don't store food even though they could they're not processing things to keep they are not worried about not having food tomorrow like the idea of uh tomorrow being a hardship is not is not uh in their mm -hmm. mind well, that's really cool to talk about because mm -hmm. they don't have a concept of tomorrow at all almost. No. We're, th there was no concept of the future or planning or mm -hmm. what are you going to do when you grow up or what, you know what I mean? Or like what's going to happen this week or next week. Yeah. It's just it's just today. It's it, I don't think we can even understand it at all because it's yeah. so far out of our realm of just how we would live or yeah, it's impossible to know how they think of the world. It is. And I, I think that goes into something else that would be great for us to touch upon. You know, a lot of people are wondering, well, why haven't they just uh, adopted a herding lifestyle? Like, why don't they just get goats and cows and this kind of trade for them and, and get them and that kind of thing? But part of the thing that keeps the... the uh, the communities running and not fighting each other is their different lifestyles. So the Hudsa, they're, they're hunter gatherers and because they're not herders, they're not farmers, they don't clash with the other communities in their region. And the reason why that's important is because in Tanzania alone, there's a hundred different tribes that live there. They all speak mm -hmm. different languages, they have different lifestyles. And so you could see where it would be very quick to get into a warlike state. And one thing that has prevented that is their different lifestyles and their different desires. So for the Hudsa, uh, you know, they they see at least when we ask them and when they talk about this, that they're like, well, why, why would I go into the towns? Why would I get animals? Why would I grow food when I have everything I need here? I have meat, I have food to eat, I have shelter from the things that I can gather, why would I go into town to work some job I don't like, to pay for something mm -hmm. and not even have enough of what I need? So it doesn't seem logical to them. And uh, and so I think that's why they haven't, despite their lack of big game, uh, transitioned into the city and become more, more modernized. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, exactly. Uh, another question, how often mm -hmm. do they get organ meats? I mean, every day. I mean, it's not a lot, but every day, yeah. absolutely every day, every time they get an animal, they get the organs. That was shocking. So they just to have me. to share it. Yeah, I had no idea yeah. they were eating so much organ meat. That was very eye opening. I, I don't know why I thought it was less often, um, but I'll tell you what, I'm not going to be shy about recommending people eat it more often after seeing that. Yeah, or maybe in small amounts, because right, there's only one organ yeah. and then there's a lot of people, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe they get three animals so that, yeah, everyone can get a little piece. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do they get bit by insects? You know, these people did not care about thorns or insects <laughs> or anything. They were charging through with no pants on. We all were told to wear long pants, which was very clutch. And they just <laughs> yes. did not care. <laughs> no, and they were wearing sandals, hiking in the mountains in thorns. I can't express how many thorns there are everywhere. Uh, thorns so much. So right before the bush baby, the first one was caught, uh, Draco stepped on a thorn and it went through his hiking boot and into his foot. I mean, these are very large thorns mm -hmm. and yet they're in flip-flops basically. So yeah, they, they seem very immune to the bugs, to really everything. <laughs> It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, how often are they eating during the day? And if you had to guess caloric intake, what would it be? Which was crazy because we tried to calculate the caloric okay. intake and it was low, very slight, very modest. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll answer first about the how many times a day. This was a little bit interesting to me is they don't have meal times for one in general, right? It's just, it just happens. And so, and they cook the animals slowly. So they're not snacking. And like you said, they don't bring snacks. That's never a thing. But eating a, an animal could take a few hours just because they're doing it like one piece at a time. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah. Their caloric intake from what I could calculate was low, maybe like 800 to 1000 from what I could see, uh, you know, because you have to remember they're not eating a lot of fat. So when the women are cooking up, let's say vegetables or making a soup, uh, and again, very limited vegetables, but there's not fat in there. And that's where if you're eating a carbohydrate, you would get most of the calories. And so it's basically lean protein. And anyone who's been on a lean protein diet knows how much food that takes to build up the calories. So yeah, definitely definitely seems like the calorie uh, intake was low. They go long periods of time without eating and they just eat when food is there, but they're not anxious. They don't get that, um, that hangry that, that we are so well known for. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also yeah. though, we're bringing them food. Like I brought them my, them my nose to tail biltong mm -hmm. and stuff. And we gave them some macadamia nuts from Hawaii. Yeah. So I, I think this group was su supplemented with sort of other foods. Definitely. Yeah. But but they also aren't giant people, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they, maybe they could subsist on, you know, 1200 calories a day and be okay. fine. But they, they I mean, yeah. yeah, they were smaller and we even brought them uh, gifts at the end. So we brought them uh, a ton of goat meat and some other things and they just put it to the side to eat later. So, so they really are not in a state of needing food at this moment. Like we are. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a good one. Someone asked about plant medicine. Um, seems like they just smoke weed. <laughs> it, um, no, they do. What do they feed? Can I speak to that? Because okay. that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the plants that were growing right around both of the Hudsa clans was the same plant that the Maasai so regarded for their health uh, and their health protective benefits. And yet the Hudsa didn't use that one at all. In fact, they used a plant right next to it for very minor things, like if someone was injured or if someone had a cough, they would use the bark from that. So that was mainly what their medicines were for, were for bronchial type infections. And they said usually they would last for, when they would catch an infection, it would last for like one to three days. They'd drink the tea and then they'd be fine. It was common for them to make soup, uh, for the Maasai and the Hudsa to make soup. That was very common. But the the plant medicine, I, I think, wasn't needed at a large amount because they didn't have many ailments. That's good. And mm -hmm. um, then we could do the difference between the women and the men and their diet. Yeah, uh, there were so many differences in health and in diet. Uh, the women really sat around a lot of the day with the kids. And like I said, they they just didn't seem as healthy in the first clan, second clan radiant, but the first group just not as healthy, a bit overweight. Their feet were kind of like club feet. Most of the women had that. Uh, that said, they don't have any of the fertility issues or, or period pains or any of those kind of things, but uh, but not the same level of health. The women, when I was with them, they were mostly preparing pumpkin leaves to eat, and they would make that into a soup. They remove the fiber from the stem and also from the leaves. It was an interesting process I hadn't seen done anywhere else. Uh, so that was the first clan. The second clan did the cassava. Uh, I think the women get less organ meat, and I also think they get less meat definitely in the first clan, mm -hmm. but that would be by observation only. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just because the men, yeah. well, I mean, sometimes on the hunt, they'll just eat it out in the yeah. bush too, or they just, it seemed like they kind of hogged it, you know, they're, yeah. they're sitting around the fire and they were going to eat most of it. But uh, yes. yeah, yeah, it That's... seems like the men would do more of the organ meat, not for a purpose, not for anything. It's just that they're preparing the animal. And as they're preparing the animal, they're eating the raw organ meats and the women are mm -hmm. on the other side of the camp. And, uh, and so then, you know, they get the, the muscle meat, but it didn't seem strategic. Yeah. And again, we should always just preface that this yeah. is what we observed while we were there. So if we weren't there, maybe the woman, you know, maybe they bring some liver over to the woman. I, I have no idea because yeah. we couldn't observe it all. And in my questions to the women, they did say that they ate it uh, and that they ate it pretty often. It just wasn't something that we saw. Okay. Um, I have one more thing here, kind of at the end, but it was really interesting that the chief that kind of had bad teeth and, you know, maybe wasn't as healthy because they were getting all the tourists. Yeah. We tested his blood sugar after he ate the honey treat and it wasn't so good. No, it was fascinating. Okay. So, 
uh, we were bringing around this, this blood glucose and ketone meter to test uh, different members from different communities. And, and we were trying to get them in the morning before they had eaten. And so we got a lot of the members, but I had passed out my gifts. It was our last day we were leaving and they tore into the honey and sesame. And so when we tested the chief, who was the one with the worst teeth, uh, although very athletic, uh, his blood sugar, I tested him shortly after, maybe 10, 15 minutes after, and it was 250. I think it was 257. We have it on camera, so I can give you the exact. But I... Might have been 273. It was actually. so high. It might have been 273. Yeah. And we can confirm that again because it's on camera. But it was astoundingly high. And I'll tell you what I did, Brian, once I got here to South Africa. I tested myself because they have those bars here. They've got a Greek population here, so I was able to get them. And I tested myself. I gave myself the same timeline and did it in the morning. And my blood sugar was 93. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so there was a big difference. And so I tried it again. I did it with uh, plantains and with more honey and sesame the next day. Same response. So he definitely, uh, something was wrong with him. He definitely was maybe getting food from Taurus or something to where his blood sugar was very destabilized, especially for an athlete. Someone doing that amount of exercise to not be burning off your glucose really says something. Now, the elder, the older man who was going on the hikes with us, who was maybe 50, maybe 60 at the most, I would say, uh, his blood sugar was phenomenal. It was really perfect. And some of the other members too. And many of them were were in the exact same level of ketosis as the Maasai, 0.1, very mild state of ketosis. But the chief, I didn't bother to test his ketones because his blood sugars were through the roof. So high. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, yeah, the, the other guy, he didn't, he didn't even want the honey. Well, that was interesting. Yeah. So yeah. the older guy had a, uh, it was in the 80, 87, 86, mm -hmm. his blood sugar, and he's, he's, he didn't want the honey. So it's kind of interesting. The yeah. guy that doesn't want the treats had, you know, good blood sugar. I think mine was 77. Very much so. But, yeah, no, yours yeah. was perfect. Yours was perfect. And that goes yeah. into the vices too. A lot of people have been asking about the vices of each of these different communities. And obviously with the Hudsa, it's mainly the smoking, but they definitely drink when they can. And uh, and they, they grab the sweets, especially the younger ones when they come into, into the community. Whereas if you take someone uh, like the Maasai community, they only have drinks when there's a big celebration and they don't tend to celebrate things. Like they don't have birthdays and things like that. It's like uh, circumcisions. <laughs> Is when you would have that mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. that's like once when you're 18 right yeah <laughs> so or 16 16 mm -hmm. or 18 whatever it was but uh yeah it was interesting that that chief guy so this is kind of what i've seen like people are f familiar with professor tim noakes he was you know this this amazing athlete and you know marathoner and and a doctor and all this stuff and he developed pre-diabetes while being thin and while running marathons and it seems like what was going on with this chief is you can be thin, right? Some people are like, oh, what I'm thin, I'm fine. And like, I eat McDonald's, but I'm thin, I'm fine. I'm like, that's not true. Yes. You have to look at what's going on with your blood sugar and there's a lot more going on. And so this guy, he's, he's perfectly healthy suppose, right now, but I mean, it kind of spells out that he could be having problems later if he continues this. Yes, definitely. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. all right, uh, very good. Anything else we missed? Oh, people always want to know about salt. They don't eat salt, but if you give it to them, they'll eat it. Unlike the Maasai, who don't want salt at all. That's definitely something. Uh, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the salt's always interesting. Yeah, I know that the Maasai just don't want it in general. The Hadza, mm -hmm. they're like, we don't need it. We don't want it. Yeah. But if you have it, I'll take oh, it. Sure. You know, like the treats, I'll <laughs> yes. take it. Good stuff. <laughs> well, thanks so much. We'll be back for the Botwa next time, the Pygmies in Uganda. Another very interesting leg of our tour. Yeah. Uh, make sure to go back and listen to the Maasai episode that we did as our first episode. And where can people find you? Ah, me, enableyourhealing.com or Mary Ruddick CNC uh, for Instagram, YouTube, just my name, Mary Ruddick. Awesome. Well, I'll put this on uh, the Food Lies YouTube channel. I'll try to add in some photos and some things so people can see what we're talking about. And uh, yeah, we'll be back soon for another one. Thanks, Greg. 
All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with a friend, for giving it a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. Go to nosetail.org for the amazing meats delivered to you, the biltong, seasonings, body care. All of this I use every day. They're all really part of my life now. You can also go to sapien.org and join the Sapien program. You can lose weight, reverse disease. Anywhere in the world, we have all the videos, the whole course. We have a health coach. It's all backed by Dr. Gary. And we also have the Sapien Tribe. If you want to get more involved in the community, we have a few lifetime memberships available before they're gone. These are at a huge discount. You can join and be part of the founding members of this. We are going to be here for years and years to come and you could be part of the very beginning of it and help shape this whole sapien organization and sapien movement, whatever that may be. It's only going to grow as people understand the health benefits of eating animal foods and whole foods and regenerative agriculture and all that. So sapien.org, you can link to everything there, including the film on Indiegogo. And that's about it. We'll see you again next week. Bye.